Okay, so um, thank you everyone for logging in in whatever time zone you are in. So this is the third part of our um, webinar series on eventing horses and fitness and training and nutrition. So we've got five riders with us um, for this session and it's going to be a little bit different. So it's going to be a little bit less formal. There's no presentation that will go alongside this. We're just going to have a really good chat um, to these guys and um, get their insight on how they train and, and keep their horses fit um, and competition ready. So these questions that we'll go through today are based on questions that we've received from those of you that have registered um, or those that have come up in the previous two webinars. So the first one that was done by David on um, heart rate monitoring and then the one that was done with Clarissa last week on the nutrition side of things. So we'll work our way through the, the, the panel um, in this session. Now, if you do have any questions, we've actually got quite a few to get through. So we might not get to everybody's questions, but if you do, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A box so we can try and keep track of those. Anybody having technical difficulties, uh, feel free to um, pop them in the chat box um, and we'll respond to those ones directly to you in there. So just to walk you guys through um, our panel here today. So they'll each go through and sort of introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about them and a bit of an overview of how they manage their horses. So firstly, we've got um, Amanda. So Amanda, do you want to go through and do a quick little introduction on yourself? Just a couple of minutes. A whole couple of minutes. That's quite a long time. Um, okay. It doesn't have to be that long. <laughs> So um, I live in Victoria, um, the south part of Australia, and I've always had event horses. I have a small yard, so I ride a total of five horses altogether, four currently competing, as well as doing some show jumping as well. Um, and I also coach, so my day is pretty much, um, you know, do my, my gym fitness work, then come back and work all the horses and then um, teach in the afternoons. Um, what else do you want to know, Beck? Like my, the general sort of program for horses or? Yeah, well, we'll go through individual programs in a minute. Um, but I mean, that's a really good overview just, just for now as an introduction. Great. Um, Emily, do you want to introduce yourself to people as well? Um, yeah, so I'm 26. I'm a full-time physiotherapist and, a, and I'm a five-star event rider. Um, I'm based in Western Australia and I've always lived here. I grew up in a country farming town in WA and now I'm based in Perth. Um, I have varying between three to five competition horses in work um, and yet yeah, working a full-time physio job and I've just started up my physio business um, operating from the country as well. So my schedule is, is pretty crazy trying to juggle all those things. Um, I have a real interest in um, rider fitness and I do a lot of lecturing on rider fitness. And I treat a lot of horse riders. So I do a lot of clinical Pilates and tailored um, fitness programming and strength training for equestrian athletes. Perfect. Excellent. Um, Dom and Jimmy, do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Oh, so I'm Dom. It's my wife, Jimmy. Um, I'm originally from Queensland, Australia. We uh, live in uh, Pennsylvania for the main part of the year. And then right now we're actually currently in Florida because we relocate south for three months for the winter. Um, and we have a, you know, a training business uh, sort of fluctuates anywhere. I think we have 16 or 17 horses now. Uh, coach riders. I'm a pretty busy clinician. Um, and my wife also has a... Yeah, a, I actually work all, um, as well as I have a handful of competition horses and teach some lessons as well for our business. And then I also work for an equine marketing firm called Athletics. So we work with, um, you know professional riders and equine companies to help market their brands and market themselves as riders. So I do that as well on the side to try and, you know, supplement this lifestyle a yeah, little bit. Very expensive lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's us. Perfect. Um, and Megan. 
Howdy, guys. Um, yeah, so I'm in SA and I, um, I write and teach full time. So I sort of write in the morning until about 11 o'clock and then teach from 11 until 6 or 7 p.m. again, trying to pay, pay for the horses and, then, um, and pay for the fuel and, and entries. Um, we've got a team of oh, got a team about seven event horses, but we have, have a lot of sale horses in as well and all different sort of types and sizes. So we have about 15 in, in work. Um, it keeps us busy enough. And, um, yeah, so that's what we just do here in, in SA. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. So we're going to jump straight into the questions that people have sort of asked and they're very varied. Um, so maybe the first one we'll jump off with is um, how do you guys manage young or green horses versus your more seasoned competition horses? Um, and how do you change those conditioning sort of goals um, for your horses as they move up through the grades? So um, Amanda, do you want to talk maybe about if you get a, say, off the track horse that you're looking to campaign? Sure thing, Bex. So I think for me, the main difference between um, when we've got something that's really green versus when we've got something that's more experienced is the more experienced horses need to be fitter, but they don't need to practice their skills as much because they've learnt those skills, but they do need to be fitter to cope with more of the, the you know, the length that they've got to do and the speeds that they've got to do. Um, whereas with those young ones, particularly something off the track is interesting because it's generally already had um, at least one fitness prep. So most of the time we'll find that the thoroughbreds are pretty fit and it's all to do with um, skill with them. So getting them out, trying to make them as relaxed as possible and trying to teach them the ropes. Um, and generally I find that by the time you've done flat work sessions and taken them out, hacking and little cross country schools and stuff, they're pretty much fit enough to do that basic level that they've got to start at yep perfect so what about you Megan did you have anything obviously you've got some of your own horses as well um so it might be a slightly different point of view absolutely so um definitely you you um breed these crossbred horses they're they're just not fit and they're just not there and they've got no muscle memory um and they get tired very easily so we just you know take it really slowly with them for the, the baby horses they could just do a session that's 20 minutes you know and then we just sort of slowly build things up from there um and then when they get sort of fit enough and educated enough to do their jumping um i've got no problem with like doing small jumping exercise with them three days in a row in that week and they have a few days off because they tend to sort of learn things better and as, as amanda said they need to practice their skills and and learn by like doing things over and over again but in small amounts not to blow their brains or to make them think that it's too hard because they get too tired doing that as well so yes we just take it really slowly but we sort of um repeat things and they get lots of little ho holidays so they could have like a, a month's work and they might get like six days off you know yep. then they come in again so lots of little breaks rather than big breaks twice a year and even with the more experienced horses like my guys have had quite a big prep um leading into their first event of this season because um my two star horses were particularly fat and unfit and never had been fit before on those warm blood sort of types and um they did a three-day prep at the end of last year and they still couldn't make time and they um we did a, a full prep, but they just couldn't do en enough work to get them fit enough. And I knew that, so I didn't run for time cross country. But they've come in from that summer break so much sort of fitter and ready to go on. So after their, their first event this weekend, those guys will then get four days off just to recover, recoup, and then go again with them. So um, it's important to sort of, you know, have those little breaks for them. Yeah. Perfect. And what about you, Emily? Anything different there? Um, yeah, I think what Amanda and Megan have just touched on is exactly my way of thinking as well. I think the emphasis of if your horse hasn't been fit before, the prep and the fitness training required to get them fit 
um, is a long road. And then once they've been at that level of fitness and our top horses that are going around the star classes that have been doing it for a few years, their fitness training is a lot different and um, it doesn't take them as, as long to get to that peak fitness. And so you don't have to run their legs off like once they've been fit just have to um, get them back up to that point, um, which is where I use my uh, KR Clocker app to, to monitor that and where they're sitting. Um, and yeah, it definitely requires less, less mileage to get them there. Yeah, perfect. And what about you guys? Obviously, um, Dom and Jimmy, you train in multiple states as well. So does your, how does that change throughout the year when you do move between the, your two sort of locations? We've kind of got an interesting thing here in America where if you go south for the winter, you can be competing in January and the show's going all the way till the end of November. So uh, we, we obviously, you've got to be careful. You don't want to do too much on them. Um, we try to compete them sort of around once a month. But I thought what the girls were saying is interesting. You know, like oh. I've heard this uh, before where people <laughs> say, you know, the experienced horses, the competitions are really more for you as a rider. Like w once they've been around, it's actually more your practice. And then on the greener horses, it's all exposure and teaching them and showing them new things. So I'd say the young horses, we really try to keep it different every day. Um, you know, like we may jump them, like what uh, Megan was saying, we may jump them a couple of times a week, but one of the jump schools might be more gymnastics and rideability. And then the, the other jump school may be taking them off the farm and going and jumping a little uh, show jump round at the show. So it, I think you got you have sort of more variant like variation in the schooling on the young ones and then the experienced guys it's more getting them fit managing their soundness and then polishing the skills you know like working on knocking a few marks off the test or you know getting them a bit softer or whatever as opposed to like teaching them new things all the time i would yeah. say too we've had um and you know it's so hard when you get your crossbred horses, you know, we've got like one German sport horse that has a lot of thoroughbred and she's super easy to get fit. And then we have another one that's actually technically similar in blood, but way more difficult to get fit. You know what I mean? Um, we have found that, you know, we add, you know, jogging, like long, slow jogs for them, even canters up, you know, a slow grade you know, just to kind of teach them to, to push and to become fit, you know, you almost have to, what we have found that you almost have to kind of train them to be fit or want to be, you know, want to keep going. And um, we do that a little bit with young guys, not anything hard, you, you know, not overly hard, but we do, you know, ask them to push a little bit in that fitness, the ones that it doesn't come so natural for them to want to be fit. Yeah. Wow. yeah, beautiful. And I guess I guess that leads into a couple of other questions. I mean, we had quite a few people, Megan, that have not just thoroughbreds that they're doing eventing on. So I guess, how do you tailor your fitness and I guess nutrition plans, given that some of these horses can be a little bit more prone to being a bit more chunky, mm -hmm. uh, to really uh i guess uh tailor your approach uh for these heavy horses versus your thoroughbred type horses yeah absolutely so um we definitely like to feed so going from the feeding first we feed a lot of grass hay and um obviously we like to have, have grass hay in the stables so we don't get ulcers and all that kind of management of all that sort of side of them as well but the little fatties i've got a couple of little fa fatties lander and barbie <laughs> and we just had to like take away that all the hay there <laughs> and they could eat all night and just give them a certain amount of hay and, and that was it. Um, and then we spaced their diets. They get fed like a little supplement feed in the afternoon and they come in at sort of 3.30. They get their dinner at five and they don't get their hay till half by six at night. So we try and space it out. They think their throats have been cut, but we just had to like put on a, a diet. Um, and I'm also like, I'm a real sort of non grain feeder like I, I when I was younger I tied a horse up on loose and and oats a mare I've got lots of mares so I'm like I'm really scared of oats and um so I don't feed oats but I've had a mare um Barbie who was really fat and was almost um insulin re resistant so we had her tested for all of that and she was right up there almost in that 
medication and we've actually ended putting up her on this oaten chaff and crushed barley. And that's all she gets. And off her loosened chaff for her ulcers for her stomach because she had a reaction to the loose and that was making her even crestier and itchy the whole time. So every horse is so different. And because she was imported, you know, it's taken a while to work out that actually the loosen wasn't good for her. Maybe some of the grass wasn't good for her as well. So you've really got to work through all those things. And since just changing her feed, she's literally lost 80 kilos. And she was huge. She was like a, a, a foundering pony. She's this big stallion neck on her. Now she's lean and looks like an event horse. And her and Lando were the two that we were struggling to get fit last year as as Jimmy was saying, they just did not want to keep going up the hills. So we do a lot of hill work with my guys and they do it um, at least twice a week. So Wednesday is our fitness day and it's all just like we go trot up the hill, walk down, trot up the hill, walk down, <laughs> and canter up and down. And we do lots of that with them. And you just keep building that until they um, get fitter and like we use the, the heart rate monitors to make sure that they at the start, they're not working too hard and getting the heart rate up too high. And then as they get fitter, we're going to make sure we actually get the heart rate up high enough to make them fit enough as well. So um, definitely lots of heel work with those horses. And because they're a bit heavier, the heel work ends up taking away that pressure on their joints. You're not on the, on the flat ground, repeatedly going on that. On the And, you know, our, our ground here is not soft and we don't have the luxury of having a sand track to go up so we sort of put a bit of poo and shavings out on our hill from the stables to try and make it as 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 nice as we we can but yeah we definitely um had to tailor all those feed programs and get on those hills as much as the horses will cope with to get them fitter yeah that's perfect and i think you know you've touched on a really important point there you know with some of the nutrition side of things you know making sure that we hit the individual goals of individual horses. It's difficult to run a yeah. team um, because they're invariably going to have some different requirements or different challenges, metabolic rates, etc. So, um, yeah, definitely looking at things individually is helpful. Um, and I guess, Tom and Jimmy, you guys do have the luxury of having a lot of hills to work with as well. So how do you use elevation and hills to improve your fitness? So... How do you change when you don't maybe have as many access to hills? Um, what can you do to, to buffer that? Or do you use beach work? Do you use other modalities as well? So this time of year is the most challenging because in Florida, it's actually really flat uh, where we are. But the one benefit we have is the ground is really good because Florida is basically just a big giant sandbar. So um, for the most part, even when it's raining or whatever, the ground stays pretty good, pretty consistent. But because it's the start of the season, it doesn't affect us too much because we're mostly doing interval training this time of year. Um, so I get them started sort of towards the end of January. And um, we have a in our cross-country paddock. I kind of uh, find a, a loop that we do. Yeah. yeah. And it's a little yeah. bit slightly undulating. Um, but it's, um, it's flat enough that you can go. There's that balance between going fast enough on the flat that you get their heart rate high enough, but you're not going so fast, you're running the legs off them. And, um, and, it, and by the time we, we start heading north back to PA where we do have mountains to go up, um, I've done enough interval training that they're about ready to start going up a hill. Like I can't really get them a whole lot fitter with the intervals. Um, so it, it just it sort of depends. Um, the, the other thing I would say as well is, is you know, it's, it's also managing the, the ground. Megan touched on that. Like, um, once we get home and we get more to like a clay soil, then sometimes if we haven't had rain for a while, it gets the ground will get a bit hard, um, which I might substitute uh, what was going up a hill, going over to a, a sand track and doing a little bit quicker. So it's sort of managing the speed and the distance based on the ground. And um, yeah, it's a little bit of a moving target in the summer, but this time of the year, it's a little bit more predictable. And we are, I mean, we're pretty lucky where we are in Pennsylvania. There's at least two or three, you know, footing tracks with, with, a, with a bit of elevation. One is quite short. Phil Dutton's place has quite a short uh, track, but it's pretty inclined. And then Boyd's is a bit longer and it's a slow grade, but it's, it's long. So you can get going pretty quick on it. So, you know, on the, the days that we need to gallop, but, you know, normally we'd go up our, we call it Nelson's Hill. So we'd go up Nelson's Hill where it's, 
takes us about two and a half minutes to get up going what five well it's or... it's it's point eight of a mile so what's that a little over a k and a half uh and oh yeah just just under yeah just under a k and a half and it's about an eight eight percent incline so it, 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 it will get their heart rate way, way up, but it's basically a mountain, so. But you know, we might go and do that where like the young horses only go up once, whereas like the Kentucky horses or five-star horses are going up a couple of times. But if, if that's not gonna work, then we might go and do Boyd's Hill and do it five times quick. You know, or, you know, we just, it just varies. It just depends on, you know, we, we I think, choose our gallops um, pretty particularly on how the ground is. For the most yeah. part. Perfect. So would you say, and this is another question we actually had a lot of questions specifically on, was um, the use of really strict interval training type protocols um, to get your horses fit. Would you say that you followed that sort of um, situation? <laughs> yeah. So, so, I mean, I have a bit of a, you know, every horse is different and you, like uh, Emily mentioned, you know, once they've been there, I'm always amazed at how quick they, the experienced horses come back. You know, it's not like people, whereas, you know, you get ready for a triathlon and then you, you know, take a, month off. take a couple months off and eating pizza and you basically go back to where you started. I feel like horses, once they've been in a prep a few times, they, it comes back faster. So I'm always like kind of paying a little bit of attention to the heart rate and stuff like that. But I normally will go sort of on a four or five day um, every fourth day or every fifth day. And I do um, they, like start the intervals at say three fours or three fives, depending on what they've done. And then I do that for two weeks. So normally that's like four lots at a number. And then I add a minute. So it's like three fours for four times. And then it's three fives for four times and then three sixes. And then that gets me to about three sevens or three eights by the time we go north. And then I kind of transition into the hill work. Perfect. Um, so Amanda, um, how do you find you can keep your horses engaged? And I guess some of the mental fitness exercises as well, um, really you know, keeping horses, not getting so bored, or do you just mix up their workload? Do you have certain things that you do do? I think having an inventor, I don't think I've ever had a bored horse. Um, I think when I, I had a little horse, I used to do a lot of dressage on, and that's when I really understood how boring that is when they're going into the same arena the whole time. Or you might, even if you walk them around a bit before or after around the property, it's still the same the whole time. So in terms of keeping the horses fresh, by the time I've done three different disciplines um, in the week over a six day week. I, yeah, I've never had a board horse ever. Um, but definitely um, in terms of, no, I, look, even, even the work that you do on the flat, like, you know, maybe if they have the Monday off after competition, Tuesday's work will be more loosening work and trying to kind of realign their body into a more sort of dressage approved shape versus the galloping one they did on Sunday. Um, and then the jumping work again, um, talking about more of an experienced horse, I might have, you know, one day a week, which is more on their technique. So some grids and some exercises and another day that we'll be practicing riding courses and distances. And then the, uh, the fitness work again, I think also with the horses of the level that I have, they're quite spicy in their temperament. So all of them want to go. Um, so I would vary, say, my, my two fitness sessions. One might be, you know, sort of longer, slower stuff and doing the hill work and, you know, um, more of that heart rate training, whereas another time I might do more intervals, short intervals, which might be, you know, say four to five minutes of just jumping and schooling and then give them a break and jump in school and do that three or four times. So, yeah, if, if any of my horses got bored doing that, I'd have to send them for therapy, I think. <laughs> Yeah, which is definitely ideal. I mean, eventing does, you know, present that opportunity where you can really mix it up, I guess, in comparison to maybe some of your other disciplines, like you say, dressage, that is maybe a little bit more arena bound. Um, but I guess the other thing that comes into play here for, you know, I guess both you, Amanda and Emily, um, is looking at human fitness. You know, you guys are very passionate about this sort of area so it plays a huge role in success you know the optimal performance of a combination doesn't just rely on the horse so um 
what do you guys do as part of your daily fitness routine or um, maintenance program to keep yourselves in top condition? So maybe Amanda, do you want to go first? Um, yes. Yeah, so I, I used to work as a personal trainer, so I love the gym. It's my place to go every morning. So I'll try and go, basically try and go seven days a week. It doesn't mean I work really hard seven days a week. Like one day might just be stretches and yoga, but um, I try and do that as often as possible. Last week, I think I got there maybe three times because, you know, we had early training sessions and all this sort of other stuff that got in the way. Um, but mine is based on um, functional fitness. So I want to be able to move my body with the greatest range of motion that every joint can possibly give me. I want to have enough cardio fitness that I can hop on multiple horses and go cross country and not be tired and ineffective. Um, and then I also want to have really good balance and flexibility. So there's no, um, you know, it's a real mixture, right? You know, HIIT training, high intensity interval training is probably something that I would um, recommend. I do um, some, some weight training. Um, and then I do love a bit of Pilates and yoga. I do all the exercise off and eat dirt. Then that's a really great thing for riding. Um, and I've just started, I don't know, Em, if you have Kiza over in Western Australia, but it's a physio-based exercise program where you go in and I'm in the middle of being assessed at the moment. So I've got tennis elbow and a dodgy arthritic hip and they look at um, all of the issues that you've got and then they set you up on all of their different machines and they're so specific to you. So I'm really looking to do that because I want to ride for as long as possible way into my old age and I've had like us all we've had some falls and injuries and stuff and I want to be really sound and use as much of my body for as long as I can and also it makes me very aware of my symmetry so obviously when we're riding we have to be completely symmetrical on the horse and you know even with a few injuries if I'm aware of that and I can say to myself oh, okay yep that's a bit switched off this side I need to go and you know have that worked on or you know whatever then I have a greater awareness. Yeah, perfect. And I guess, um, Emily, obviously you can comment certainly from a physio point of view, but also from, you know, uh, I guess a different point of view where you do have another job, you know, you're not riding horses all day, every day. Um, you know, and that's certainly a lot of people that have registered to listen to this. You know, they are in that boat. They love eventing. They're very passionate and they compete, <laughs> but um, they do have other jobs in there as well. So maybe can you talk us through what you do to mix that up? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think what Amanda said like really encompassed everything that I really promote with equestrian fitness. So obviously you've got some people that ride all day, every day, which is great because um, there's nothing like training your discipline or your sport like doing the real thing. So we don't want to take away from that and that is so important but not doing that just in isolation because cross-training is so important. And if you're struggling with something within your sport, it doesn't matter what sport you're doing, if you just keep training your sport and you don't isolate what you're struggling with outside of your sport, it's going to be really hard for you to get better at that. So that's where the things like I do a lot of clinical Pilates um, with my clients um, and on myself as well. And that is all about, um, definitely limbering up and doing a little bit of stretching and things, but mainly you're targeting your weaknesses and targeting your strengths and, and being aware, like being body aware of where your issues lie. And sometimes when you're self-analyzing, you, you get it wrong. You need an outsider to look in and, and assess you as a whole and see your weaknesses and target them. So there'll be a lot of stretching um, as well as but majority strengthening and isolating muscle groups. And what we talk about um, is uh, being able to dissociate movements, which is like horse riding through and through. It's like, can you move this body part without moving this body part? Can you stabilize through here and activate this muscle? And so it's very tailored like that. And I have a lot of horse riders that I said that I treat. And whenever they ride either that afternoon after Pilates or the next day, they're like, I always ride my best because 
they just feel this feeling that they haven't felt before where they feel very like wrapped around the horse. They feel very even. Um, they can feel those muscles that we'd worked on earlier in the day or the day before, and they can isolate those muscle groups. And so they become a much more what we call like an effective rider. Um, and so that has a huge improvement in rider um, performance. And even though they're not sweating and working really hard in the sessions, um, it's all about being able to learn better body awareness so then you can apply it to when you're riding. So it's a bit like what Amanda was saying with like injury prevention as well. As soon as you're feeling something niggle and we're pretty good at ignoring those niggles, which are then exacerbating to something else um, down the track. As soon as you're feeling a bit of tightness or you're not feeling 100% straight, we're like on the forefront addressing those issues um, so they don't exacerbate into something um, more serious or um sort of affect your performance too much. So we're always on um, the forefront of addressing those things as soon as they start to rear their head. Um, as well as that, I think it's important, like if you look at equestrian athletes and when they're competing, when we're going cross country, we can be going in a five-star event up to 10 minutes and we are working at our max heart rate for that long. So it's very high intensity and we have to be trained um, at that level of intensity, which is where Amanda was saying the HIT training comes in. So HIT training for those that um, don't know is a high intensity um, interval training. So you're trying to do exercises and it could be including weights or it could be um, body weight exercises. And you're just trying to elevate your heart rate high and, and work in that high level of training for an extent period of time having a rest and then going again which is perfect for especially people that have multiple horses and they might go cross country on one horse come back cross country on another horse so you, you're you're tailoring your energy systems that you're using when you're competing likewise if you put a heart rate monitor even doing your um your dressage test or your show jumping round again we're still working to that really high heart rate range and so it's really important that we also train that as well off the horse um so definitely the hit training is a great way to get fit especially if you're not riding lots of horses um in conjunction with the cross training of the pilates or, or yoga or the new yoga lattes which is um a combination of the two and so you're staying limber you're not stiff and blocked in any of your movements and then you're working on the activation of muscles and then personally, I do um, gym training, but I only do it once a week because of time restraints. Um, and I do that with a trainer and we, we focus on my goals. And then I do more weight-based exercises and a lot of unilateral exercises as well so that I can see um, where I'm limiting in one side versus the other. So any asymmetries and addressing those issues. So I think there's a combination of things that you can do and, it's, and it depends on the person and, and what interests you have. You know, some people um, hate certain types of training and that's okay. It's just finding what, what suits you and targeting um, the heart rate intensity that you have to get to, but also focusing on the, the strengthening and conditioning tailored to your equestrian discipline. Yeah, that's a, that's a really, really good point. Um, and so Megan... There's been a massive rise, I guess, jumping back to the horse side of things, a massive rise in the popularity of water modalities and water treadmills and walkers and all of those sorts of things over the past few years. Um, so do you use any of these and you know, sort of in your experience, how do you use them and are they effective or just as effective um, for training and recovery um, in the way you manage your team? We might have lost Megan's sound. Hang on a second. <coughs> there we go. You've got you back now. Oh, no, you've gone again. <laughs> Just move it down a little bit. Nope. That's all right. We'll get you back. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's all right. Maybe just unplug it and try plugging it in again. Is it? How's that? You hear That's me there? It. Got okay, it. Right now. That's right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so yes, we've been really lucky to um just recently um actually go into business with friends of ours at their place, and we've put in a, a dry treadmill up to gallop speed, a water treadmill, and a equine spa. So that's been operational now since sort of the middle of January. So all the start, start of, of Jan January, so not very long. So we've really been able to feel our horses start from being a bit unfit from the start of the season and starting to use all these machines and feel how it's actually affecting them. So we use um, the spa, which is like they just go and stand in there and have really cold water, like a big spa on their legs on a Wednesday after they've done their fitness work or cross country schooling. So it's a day of my guys, I'll jump this morning, cross country, go in the float, go down the road, go in the spa. And that makes their body recover over their back, especially really well, not just their legs, a whole body recovery and um, if they do feel amazing from that we also then go on the water treadmill on a Thursday um, instead of working them so when we first start obviously you're going to start off like slowly low, low levels of, of, of water but now they're up to quite a high depth of water having a trot in the water as well and even after the, the fourth week of doing spa on the Wednesday treadmill on the Thursday I felt their backs change under the cell. They were just stronger, they're more even behind. Barbie, who again, she's just a lazy, lazy, doesn't want to push or, or, or travel that straight. It straightened her up and made her push evenly because she can't not do that on that water treadmill. They've only done a couple of sessions on the dry treadmill, and I'm going to I'm starting to introduce that on a weekend, on a Saturday, if we're not competing, mainly because the the ground is good on the dry treadmill. It's really even. We can vary the incline on that. I'm not having to walk back down the hill to get back up the hill again. Again, so when you're doing a hill work on them, there's always that problem of walking down the hill and putting pressure on their joints, walking back down the hill again. Um, on the dry treadmill, they can just put up and we can put up and down and vary their speed up to canter. Um, I haven't got them on there yet. I probably won't. Just... Um, a bigger sort of canter on a hill and um, and they went and show jump the day after they went on the dry trimmer for the first time and they felt again amazing in their back end. So I'm actually really excited to it's only a, a new thing for us and um, a new thing to start feeling the horses and and tailor their programs but uh, it's it's so far I'm just so excited and they're feeling really really good. So definitely the water treadmill I think um, and we have heart rate monitors on them as well on there. Um, it's actually interesting. The heart rate gets higher on the spa, the standing still while the water goes up and the bubbles start there. Oh, they get really quite tense about it. Then they just relax down into it and it's fine. Um, and the water treadmill, like you're not getting the heart rates that high up there. It's more of a conditioning um, exercise more than a particularly fitting higher heart rate one, whereas the dry treadmill, the heart rate gets higher and you can go on the incline there and, and use that um, instead of a, a fitness session on the hills for sure. But the water treadmill is definitely there for conditioning their body and building different muscles to what we can get in our normal work on them. So um, no, I'm so excited about that. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Very cool. Um, so maybe Dom and Jimmy, we've had a couple of questions sort of, asking about and it's probably a good thing for you guys to answer with some of the clients that you work with um, uh, and what you sort of encourage people to do about goal setting so you know um, if they're competing over a five or six minute course how many minutes are you guys usually training for in gallop when you're doing fitness work at home or how how are you recommending people get fit for a certain target like that you know is it that you are recommending that people train a level higher um, in some of those lower grades compared to what they are going to then go and compete at? How do people know if they're ready to move up into the next grade? Um, so I, I think, I mean, there's obviously such variation in levels and stuff. I, I mean, step one for both rider and the horses, and this isn't everybody, is just getting them into the program of being ridden five to six days a week. You know, like... Um, 
people that are working and busy, especially in the weather is, you know, we've got people that have got a lot of snow uh, up further north here. You know, just putting them in for a few weeks, just being ridden um, and being jumped and having cross-country schooling would be step one. Assuming that they are now, you know, in sort of a, a bit of a program and they start wanting to plan a season or, or um, work towards a goal, I always encourage people to work backwards. So like from a, from a big sort of picture, is say, okay, my, my spring goal is going to be to go to this um, three-day event. And then you, you start with that and then you work your way back so that you can space out your competitions. And then that helps set the framework for the fitness work that you want to maybe incorporate. And you also probably should come up with a plan B and a plan C because horses always will find a way to um, uh, deviate your plans. But that, that, that kind of gives you the bones of the gallops, the days off, the shows, that kind of thing. And then we start filling in the gaps with, you know, we want to get to some dressage shows. We want to do some show jumping days. And you, before you know it, you've got the whole um, plan is pretty much full. As far as like with, you know, training uh, from day to day, getting ready for competitions, you know, I think we all know that when you get to the show, you want to be, there's nothing worse than walking over to the show jumping and go, oh, geez, those look pretty big. Like you want to, you want to be like, I'm doing this all the time. I'm doing these exercises. I'm exposing myself to a level of um, pressure or level of, you know, sometimes feeling a little uncomfortable. You're doing that sort of in controlled ways all the time. So that when you get to the show, you know, you're, you're well within your comfort zone and you, you've exposed the horse and yourself to those questions. I mean, I do think that the whole maybe training one level higher is a, it's a, not a bad way to, to sort of think because, you know, you, you're kind of setting yourself up for success, hopefully. But it just depends on the horse too, you know. It's, um, it's managing confidence, you know, and that kind of thing. And then as far as moving up, you know, you, there, there's a lot of questions over, you know, in America right now, we're going through a, a, a situation where they're maybe changing the rules on having how many runs you have to have before you can move up a level. I mean... I really think you've got to feel extremely confident and have, you know, and have a record that really reflects confident, good performances um, consistently before you think about moving up. And I always ask myself, you know, when I'm thinking about moving up a young horse, if I've ever got any sort of question, you, you, you're never going to get in trouble doing one more at, at the level that you've been successful at but you could definitely get yourself into trouble if you didn't do one enough. You know what I mean? So I always sort of err on the side of being a little conservative that way. And, and uh, you want to really nurture the horse's confidence because once you ding it, it's, you've got to do a lot of work to give it back and, and same with people yeah. too. You know, so. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really good point. Um, so I guess we'll jump into some sort of competition-y type stuff now that kind of leads us in quite nicely. Um, so all of you guys, I'll get you all to have a little bit of an answer of this because you're probably all in different situations, but what do you guys do and how do you help your horse's recovery after either a hard training session or a competition? You know, I know Amanda mentioned before about coming home and then Monday might just be a light day, um, but do you give them a day off? Do you make their work a little bit lighter? How long are they taking to recover? And what do you look for to tell you, they're recovering well and that they are then ready to continue their training uh, back in. So maybe Amanda, if from a competition point of view, what do you sort of look at when you're at winter events or cooler events like Melbourne three day in winter? Um, what are you really doing at the event and then when you get home? Um, so when we're at the event, I think um, the big thing that I would look at first up is that you're going to make the horse hot and then they're going to cool down, but they can cool down really rapidly. So you're going through two quite different temperature ranges. Um, and so straight away, the first thing I'm thinking of is I want to keep them as warm as possible, particularly before I work them, and then to let them cool off gradually. Um, so like using quarter sheets and stuff um, to start their work and then also cooling them off um, with a quarter sheet on and taking them for a good walk or even a trot. Sometimes I think when you walk them, particularly if it's really windy, they might cool down a little quickly. So just mixing up between a, you know, a slow trot where you're not actually making the heart rate get any higher, but you're just keeping them warm enough as their heart rate reduces. 
Um, and I think when we're talking about, you know, post cross country, I'm always really wary that after I cool them off, um, and obviously they're really hot and you need to cool them off. Sometimes at Melbourne three day, for example, you don't need ice in the water. It's already cold enough. But at the summer events, you know, um, they make sure that there's a whole heap of the organisers usually, or if, if not us, put ice in the water so that it does draw that temperature down quicker. Um, once we've cooled the horses in the finish, then I usually throw in a cooler rug or a really lightweight cotton. And it depends how far I've got to walk the horse back and how cool I think the horse is in the finish. So if I want to throw that on so the horse is not getting a wind chill by the time it gets back, then I'll do that. And then when we get back to the stables, um, I don't think it matters whether it's winter or summer. I'm always checking their temperature because if you're out and the wind's been um, cooling them off quite a bit, then you get them into the stables and there's no wind. Sometimes the temperature can go up a bit more than you would like it to. Um, I'm always a big one for, you know, get them back to the stables, given they've already been washed off in the finish. Um, studs out, straight to the wash bay for a really quick shampoo. So that just gets rid of um, any of the dirt or grease or anything that's on them. And it gives us a chance to check over if there's any little nicks or cuts that we didn't immediately see. And if they need to be treated in, uh, immediately, we do that. Um, and then it's straight on with the ice boots. Um, so while you're icing their legs, you then got to pay attention to the temperature of the body. So, you know, putting appropriate rugs on, keep, keep watching them over the next, you know, sort of probably 10 to 15 minutes. You might need to chuck a, a, a woolen over their hindquarters only um, and then take them for a walk again. So it's just monitoring them um, the whole time. You know, feel their ears, see how cold they are, feel their coat, see how quickly the, you know, the heat's coming off them. Yeah, just monitoring them. Perfect. Um, and Megan, what about you for like your home events, you know, like Adelaide, dry, heat, hot, potentially? Um, how does it vary? Absolutely. Well, um, in the cool down for the big events or anything that's sort of hot like that, we always put ice boots on on them in the in the cool down, um, either the big sort of sort of multi-pocket ones if they'll walk around in those, if not just those um ice fired boots just to sort of get those tendons cooled down as quick as we can while we we cool them off obviously as a man said we ice in the water um and I think what happens quite easily is that we put a lot of effort into cooling them down at the events but people sometimes after cross country school say in the heat um don't spend enough time cooling them down at home maybe they might dispose mm -hmm. them off put their float boots back on step on the float and get home, you know, and the horse can heat up then. And they've actually sometimes done more work in a cross-country lesson than they would on a cross-country course <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. So you're really going to make sure you do cool them down properly and, you know, hose and scrape and all that sort of stuff and, and get their temperature down, take their temperature, like Amanda said, if you're at home as, as, as well, not just at the at the comps. And, and you can feel them and feel that you can feel how much heat is coming off that water still. So um, that's really important to think about that at home, that you do cool them down properly on those hot hot days um, and, and getting them walking in a, a breeze to help cool them down as well, not just standing, standing still. Um, and, and obviously at the comps, trying to get into some shade as well um, is important. Most times the cool down, they will try to have that in a, a shady spot as well. And we're pretty lucky now at the, at the events that have got a lot of, that have had the potential to, to be quite hot over here in those cool down um, spots that there's there's hoses there now as well so you can really cool them down a lot easier rather than just sponging and scraping them as well but ha putting the ice on their legs getting those boots off their legs as soon as you can putting the ice on those legs will help cool them down as well plus you know if you've got the ice vibes on take them off and put new cells on because they will melt and heat up pretty quickly when the horses have just come off cross country which is why I do like the big multi-pocket boots to crush the ice up and put those on them but some horses just won't walk around in those or freak out so you got to know your horse and and practice that at home as, as well first um but yes yeah, it's just important to get that temperature down as as soon as you can and then we also re recover afterwards in the stables with the equisage as well and then ice them again we've got whirlpool boots the horse will go into the ones that will stand them um which you know that sort of um um 
spa effect on their their legs again after cross country and again uh, an hour later do it again to really you know you overheat out their their tendons as well no very 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 important and certainly um i guess from dom and jimmy's point of view you've sometimes got humidity as well so do you change anything? Is there anything additional you need to consider when you do, you're in a really humid type environment as well? I, yes, I mean, it's, it's not dissimilar. I mean, if it's humid, sorry. Um, if it's humid, it's obviously, it's normally really hot. So we do a lot of the same deal, just water on and off, on and off, on and off. But I would say too, in the humidity, it's, it's a little bit tougher to breathe. You know, like the air can be a bit thick. So uh, I would say we, once we kind of get the water on and off them quite a few times, we do spend a lot of time walking them. You know, it's a little bit like us, you know, if we work out and the air is really heavy and really thick and then you just stop working out, it's, you just stand there, you know, it's really hard to breathe. You get really hot and you're just better if you're walking. So we do get them moving pretty for at least, I would say probably 10 to 15 minutes after a big run or or even after a big cross country school, like we'll take them out for a long hack or like a show jump, you know, if it's humid or hot, we'll take them out for a long hack. We do, I think a good bit of walking and hand walking after a humid ride like that. Uh, I also wanted to echo uh, Megan's point about like treating them for ice. I often think our local uh, petrol station guy must just scratch his head and he's like, who's this random guy in funny pants coming in at five in the morning buying like who could possibly want <laughs> bags of ice at five in the morning um but yeah like we we've got a, an esky in the trailer and every time we go galloping every time even the cross-country schools anytime i mean for the for the sake of a couple of bucks to buy a bag of ice and you know like ice isn't gonna cure a, an injury but i mean it, at the same time it's you know we would do the same thing if we had a you know, a rolled ankle or, or a bit of a bump, you know, it just, I always feel better about having it on hand and not need it than, than, than not have it and want to use yeah. it. Yeah, for sure. And I think, I think that's really important. I think, you know, like you guys have said, you know, taking care of the horse in the individual situation, um, making sure you do that during training, just as much as competition. Um, and certainly looking at it from a nutrition point of view as well. Um, I mean, just like us, um, you know, we need to be rehydrated so we can cool these horses down. But if they are sweating, we do need to have that um, electrolyte replenishment in there, um, not only to, to keep them healthy, but also to um, help them back up performance if they've got performance the next day or recover even during during training. Um, and certainly electrolytes are not just isolated towards the, the summer or the warmer temperatures. It's really required whenever horses are sweating to replace those nutrients. So looking at the ways that you're going to deliver that, um, you know, whether it is a, a liquid like in the water um, or whether it's in feed and timing that appropriately um, can be really, really important. I was going to say something there, can I bet? Yeah. Um, and Amanda will echo this as well. Melbourne three day, because it's, it's in June, it is freezing cold there. At every rider's briefing, there is the, the vets are like, monitor the water, please, guys. Every year there is a one star now, two star level horse that has serious colic there. And they've had like nearly over here they end up going to surgery like it's really bad because they just don't drink enough it's it's cold they're working hard people will work them twice a day when they're there because they don't have much to do in the horse from the stables so they'll work them in the morning work in the afternoon they're being dehydrated the horse aren't drinking and um I actually did a video for K yeah about electrolytes and stuff a while ago with that and I'm like electrolytes not just for Christmas not just for summer they're for all year round and I think people sort of forget that sometimes and just don't think about them. They don't sweat enough in the winter to maybe need them, but they actually have work and they do need them, you know. Yeah. So, um, um, yeah, and so we, we obviously have drink up from, from KR in our, in our truck the whole time too, and that is, is amazing to help them just, just drink. I mean, it's really fussy. And um, also when you get to the three-day events, they're not, or the event, they're not used to being stable or yarded maybe. Like my mare, she's used to being a good horse used to being stable and yarded, she will not drink from a bucket off the ground because she's too wary and watchful. Everything has to be put up for her. The feed has to be over the gate. 
learn all these things. So, um, you know, I think it's really important to know what your horse is comfortable with as well and putting that feed and water at a place they can get to. Um, and, and water is just so important. I think, you know, if they're, um, if they're not eating, I can cope with that. If they're not drinking, I can't. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think you're, you're totally right. You know, understanding the quirkiness of some of our individual horses and working with them and coming up with a plan before we get into the situation yeah. is the best way to go. Um, so I guess, how do we, how do you guys manage your horse's feed in the lead up to a competition and during the competition? Um, I mean, I know, Megan, you say, you say, you know, it's not such a big deal if they're not eating, uh, but how do we make sure, like, how do you guys manage this in the days leading up during the competition? And then when you come home, you know, do you have any changes um, in your feeding program? Do you try to keep things the same? How do you work around maybe not having the same hay that you might have at home if you're going long distances? So maybe Emily, now being in Perth, um, for people that might not really realize the geography of Australia. Um, so Perth is a long way from everywhere. Um, so you've got some lovely local events, but when you do come across to the East Coast events, how do you specifically manage it on a two to three day trip across the country um, to get to Adelaide or, or across to Melbourne or Sydney? Yeah, I think this is um, a lecture in itself, what it is. I've presented a lecture on traveling horses um, interstate because there's so much um, to know about it and a big part is like you're just touching on like electrolytes and things like that because when horses travel obviously um, they don't have access to water and we'll be traveling for eight hours at a time uh, sometimes and they'll get off once but sometimes they won't even have a drink when they get um, at their halfway point and they'll get to um, their very end trip for the day and we offer them water and a lot of the good drinkers um, will have a big drink but sometimes we get a bit stuck with some horses not wanting to drink so that's when you've got all your tricks up your sleeves um, like the drink up or molasses water and things like that but the electrolytes are a really big one and, and if we've got that already on the forefront doing that prior to leaving and having them used to an electrolyte however whatever source you want to use to give it to them and having them used to that so it's not sort of a shock to them and having them drinking well leading up because that is one of the big things that we face is like the dehydration especially when we go to events like um uh, the Australian International event in Adelaide when it's a hot season um and they can become very dehydrated so that's that's a big one also with feed um we always want to back off the hard feed and <coughs> uh, leading up to the traveling days and while they're traveling because they aren't going to be using that energy and we want to avoid things like tying up. Um, and so we make sure they still have their, their morning feeds and their, and their evening feeds. And sometimes we'll make a little mash of um, the like beet pulp and, and, and loose and chaff and things like that if they're, if they're not eating and trying to encourage them and again knowing your horse and, and what they like and how you can and encourage them if your electrolytes are in there you really want them to be eating their feed um, and so yeah there's a there's a lot of changes that we do um, we used to be able to bring our own hay over from WA over east with a hay certificate um, and that's recently changed now so we have to um, when we get to the border, we have to chuck out our hay and, and purchase new hay that they've never had before um, at, the, at the other side, whether it be Melbourne or Adelaide. And so as much as we can, we're trying to feed them the types of hay that they're going to get over, over east when they get there. So again, it's not a huge shock to their digestive tract when they're getting um, brand new hay types. So Again, there's only so much you can do in that sense. Like um, we'll feed our meadow hay over here and hopefully the meadow hay over there is the same, but have those systems in place rather than getting there and being like, oh, well, what am I going to feed now? Like you don't have access to that. So um, just being really prepared, I guess, in that sense. Yeah, perfect. And Amanda, I know you're really um, OCD when it comes to organising your feeds to take away. So do you have any tips? Um, you know, when preparing and taking your feed to a competition? Like, how do you do it? Um, yeah, so for short journeys, like if I'm just going, say, to a local show jumping show for two days, um, we get all of the feeds made up 
and I have these um, waterproof drawstring bags so that I'm, you know, doing the right thing by the environment, just not throwing out plastic bags all the time. And we take any supplements that um, like, say, you know, oils or things like that, um, that are wet and have them separately. So they just get put in at the time of being fed. Um, but when I go on longer trips away, I don't pre-mix the feeds. I just take them individually in the big bags that they come in because if I get to the show and, you know, the horse has gone off its feed or it doesn't want to eat something that's in there for some reason or is a bit stressy, I'd actually prefer just to give it what it needs or what it wants. So it means, you know, if it, if it just wants to eat loose and chaff, I don't have pre-mix feeds only. I could just give it loose and chaff. Um, and in terms of the haze, um, so I'll, if I have to take enough hay and then I've got to integrate it with another hay on a long-term, a uh, long, longer trip, I'll bring enough that I can mix it with that other hay and make it a gradual change. Um, but yeah, for us, it's all about having everything in bags, everything super organized. Um, and I always take a little bit more than I need in case something happens, like, you know, it rains and your bag of feed happens to get wet for some reason. Um, yeah, absolutely. Really, really good. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so yeah. we have, <laughs> go for it. Yes, and because like I'm a little bit scared of feeding grain, I've got a couple of mares that are just on oat and chaff and barley right now um, on a Sunday night because all my horses always have, have Monday off, no, no matter what, um, on Sunday night and Monday morning and Monday night their grain is hard. You know, just uh, even though they're turned out in the in the field on a, a Monday, you don't have to sort of risk them being a stable day and tying up. I'm just like so paranoid about that, um, that they just hard their grain, up their chaff, up their hay for those those three feeds, um, just so you just in that risk there. So you've got a horse on grain, always make sure you back it off. And we back it off for travelling as well. Like Emily said, even for that, you know, that that next feed that night, it'll be a bit less. You know, we, yeah. we get there just to just to make sure. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, so Dom and Jimmy, do you guys use um, antioxidants in your to help with your horse's recovery? So things like vitamin E or anything like that? Yeah, vitamin E and selenium. And um, we've got a couple of horses that um, well my my top horse actually had to have a colic surgery and um, a couple of years ago. And so we gotta be real careful with him. He, we we try to get um, try to limit his, uh, like, uh, digest the, we don't fermentable want stuff, fiber. yeah, fermentable fiber. We don't want stuff digesting in his hind gut too much. Um, so we're going to be real careful with him. And then I, I got another mare who's a little bit of a stressy traveler. She's a bit of an internalizer. So a like, little bit stressy. She's a lot of bit stressy. Well, you don't, you don't, <laughs> you, don't see it. you don't see it, but, she's but she's like a darling. She's so perfect, but she shows up and then she'll colics everywhere we go. So, uh, so like we, she'll often we'll give her fluids before we even ship her, and that seems to help her. And then I'm a I'm a huge as soon as they're doing anything kind of out of the ordinary, I'm making all their grain uh, real wet. Like I put a lot of water and and like I can make everything a mash. I just want to get as much water into them as possible. Um, and yeah, and then on the recovery side of it, you know, the other hard thing with with competitions and traveling is is it's really easy for their routine to get disrupted. Like you don't control when your ride time is, or, you know, you've got a, a six hour trip, one show, you've got a 12 hour trip, another show. So you tr I'm trying really hard to stay as close to their normal routine as I can. Um, and it, that might mean that worst comes to worst, maybe split their, their grain up into smaller, um, you know, little and lots is what we all got taught as kids, you know, if, if they're going to be in the trail, you give them a little bit of their grain and give them a little bit when you get there, as opposed to trying to give them one big meal when they don't really want to eat, um, stuff like that. But uh, yeah, lots of electrolytes. And, you know, as the, as the uh, temperatures change, you might not think they've sweated as much, and, uh, but you still got to make sure they're getting that um, magnesium and you know, all that stuff is, is so important for recovery, particularly when you combine it with travel. Yeah, perfect. Excellent. Um, so we'll wrap up, but we've just got two very quick questions. One's for Megan um, that Catherine has asked. Just um, to clarify your point when you change and reduce the grain. So even if you've had a big competition on the weekend or a Sunday, 
Um, would you lessen the feed in the evening peak in this evening Sunday feed um, or just from Monday when they've got their day off? Yes, I still do it on the Sunday. Um, and it's just if, if they're being fed like oats or barley or grain, grain, not just a pellet feed, I find a lot safe and that's fine to keep the same. But if they're just on that grain, you probably don't need to on the Sunday, but I'm so paranoid. Like I just like so paranoid. And so I tied that mare up when I was like 14 years old. So I'm just like, and all, all my mares are on pre preserve, they're on everything to make sure their muscles stay really healthy. And um, because mare just seem to want to tie it easier than gelding. So I'm just like super paranoid and just back that grain. They're not even on that much, you know, but I'm just like, for me to be feeding grain, I think Peter Hunter's going to be rolling over. He goes, he can <laughs> feed. Like I'm always trying to get to feed something that I find like changed a bit. And so, yeah, I'm super, super, super um, paranoid. And I've only started feeding that like end of last year. So for me, I'm just like really scared of it. So I just like, just back it off. And um, and if you give them more hay and more chaffs, they've still got a nice little belly and as much as they, they want to eat for those horses and uh, all the same supplements, their electrolytes, all that stays the same way. Absolutely. That's perfect. Um, and then the last question that we've got before I let you guys go, because I know you are super busy, is um, a question from Linda asking uh, or saying that she finds that the fitter she gets her horse, um, the more difficult he gets to control. Um, so she she says she's been riding a long time and he's a very talented horse, but during competition, it really affects his performance, particularly in the dressage phase. Can you guys offer any tips on how you can maybe harness that behaviour and to, you know have that balance between fitness and um, optimal performance, not explosive behaviour? Anyone want to be brave? <laughs> I, mean, we'll try to do that all the time. Uh, I, I think, uh, I, I, I mean, obviously we, we laughing because, you know, it's the, it's the age old issue of, of event horses in particular is you create this fit nuclear bomb and then it's got to go in <laughs> on the first day and, and behave itself. And, uh, you know, it, an interesting thing, it's just, this is just a completely personal thing is, is um, that I've been learning you know, I always had this this feeling like, well, especially when we're riding these thoroughbred horses is, you know, you train them up and then it's all about kind of getting them to relax and sort of containing them and not letting it all boil over. And then as I'm learning more about dressage from uh, like, like, like high-end dressage riders, you know, just because they're riding these warm blood Grand Prix dressage horses, those horses operate at a really high energy level too. To the point where they're very close to getting to that that stage where maybe it will blow out but it's it's sort of in your in your training is exposing them to the um to that the intensity yeah like there's an intensity so not necessarily a hotness but like an intensity of training that they kind of get used to that and bring it down get used to that and bring it down so that so that there's not such a huge change from when they go down the center line at a show as to, you know, you're, you're, you're going to that place a little bit at home and you're training. Now it can't be like that 100% of the time, all the time, because it would just, you know, it would blow everybody's mind. But um, I've just sort of been trying a lot harder now, instead of having this idea of um, trying to keep him in the box, you know, and it does get difficult. Don't get me wrong. I mean, they go there and they perk up and the wind's blowing and, you know, they feel fit, but Trying to, trying to teach them uh, that it's okay for their heart rate to go up. It's okay for them to feel like they're putting a lot of energy in and, and that it's, it's not something that's brand new just because we get to the show. So uh, again, it, good luck. It's always a hard thing to manage, but I, I found that that's been a helpful thing uh, in more recent times and, uh, or, or a recent uh, or a helpful mindset in your training that you're not sort of trying to, keep them from getting hot you're, you're trying to more teach them it's okay to go to that place some and, and it doesn't have to blow over i actually had um a, a horse that i competed you know through the advanced level and stuff and he was horrible in the dressage um you know i could win a lot of warm-ups so many warm-ups <laughs> i was winning and not winning in the ring and um i i had this trainer that I that I rode with for a long time growing up and she said take him to a dressage show and take him into six tests in one day and I was like that 
sounds horrible. I am not doing that. She's like, no, no, no. She's like, just take him. Six tests. She's like, not even difficult, like low level leg yields training, like low level tests, but just put him in and bring him out and then put him in again and bring him out. And um, so I did, I went to the schooling dressage show and I wanted to, you know, jump off a bridge and I went into the ring six times. And by the fifth and sixth time, he was like, I will do whatever you want. Just get me out of the ring, you know? And it was more just about putting him in there and it just being like, we're just going to keep going in here. And it's no stress. Like, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. And I think, um, and he did, he did get a lot better actually after I did that. I had kind of had to repeat that, you know, maybe like once a season to come out and like just put him in the ring a bunch of times until he settled into it again. Um, but it did make a difference for him. That was, I found that to be helpful. Yeah, good point. What about you, Megan? Yeah, well, um, the same thing as, as Jimmy there, like it's just sort of doing it again and again, but like if you um, can mark out an arena at home in the paddock, because I find it's, it's the center line that sends them off the trolley. Like once you actually get in the chest and do an okay center line, they kind of settle in and they can turn it, sig and do a nice corner, they're kind of okay, but if they get to see they're backing off, they cut the corner and they're against your leg, it just sets the whole scene for the whole test. So it's so nice to be at the big three days. You're there for a few days. There's always a practice arena. So you can do a bunch of center lines and come from outside, up the center line, turn the corner up the center line. So you can have an arena that's not your normal arena at home with the high fencing and that safe environment. Warm, and ride him in there, take him out, go to the paddock, and they've got the center line. And you're going to get the reaction from the shot home then probably. So it, like Don was saying, you, you get them in that situation and be able to diffuse it and then go back there again and diffuse it again and again. And then also, obviously, you go look at what you're sort of feeding them as well. Like, do you need to maybe actually back off the feed a couple of days out? So he hasn't got that extra energy there um, for the dressage and, um, and, it sounds like he's going to cope going cross country on a bit less energy too, potentially. Um, and then obviously you can put in those be quiet supplement in, into his feed too to help. Like that's not going to stop them from blowing up, but I find it helps them actually breathe out because when they hold their breath is when they then go off the rockers. So they can breathe out and sneeze and get them to breathe and sneeze properly. That is a really helpful thing as well. And something I've also found as well, I've got all of those ulcer medications and and we use ulcer shield a lot and you're meant to give it on an empty stomach to heal the um ulcers and 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 that sort of thing but i found i, I gave it to horse by accident once at the show because the girls hadn't given it to him in the morning i gave it to him and he got tapped up and he was a really stressy really nervous internalizing horse and i came back from working him like oh my god like he was so much better and I didn't really appreciate what the ulcer shield did to the horses until I was pregnant and had reflux and heartburn and then you have a gavastron to help settle that sort of pain you've got in your in your chest there and when they've got ulcers they don't have to actually potentially have ulcers clinically but they can get stressed and start to develop that feeling and the stomach acid rising and you can put a cap on that a little bit and a handful of loosen chaff and sort of manage the horse like that to keep that all settled down man it can make a huge huge difference as well so you know you you give him some ulcer shield before he goes to the float he gets there you give him the ulcer shield six films as you tack him up handful of loosen chaff and see if that helps as well and you can double your you be quiet for a few days leading in as well and practice that arena to paddock sort of situation and see if that helps too yeah, good good tips. Um, Emily? Um, I think, like, when you first said this question, I was like, man, if someone could, could answer this and solve all the problems, that would be amazing because <laughs> it's <laughs> that we help with the event horses. And I totally agree with what everyone said. Um, and I actually learnt that tip from Megan with the ulcer shield of giving a couple of meals up before you get on. Um, and I feel like that helped. I'm a big one for the be quiet. Um, I have my horses, my stressy horses on it um, all the time, but then I double dose them leading up to the event. And I just feel like it takes the edge off 
Um, and again, it's not going to completely resolve um, the stressful behaviours, but it just takes the edge off and makes them a little bit more rideable. And um, other than that, I think it's just, yeah, lots of exposure and getting them confident and calm in a competition environment um, to take the edge of their anxiety off um, that they're getting when they're at an event. But yeah, basically everything that these guys have said, I totally agree with and have practiced myself. Yep. Awesome. And Amanda, any little golden tips of, of advice to end our webinar here? Yeah, if they don't like dressage, just go show jumping. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I totally get that. I find that and what's really interesting is they go into a show jumping ring with horses that get quite hot on the flat and they'll pop into the ring and they'll spook at something and I'm like, whatever, that's fine. But on the flat, I'd be like, don't do that. Oh my God, because everything's so particular. So I think that when you go into that dressage ring, you feel all these tiny little things. And if we overreact at those, which we all do, then it just doesn't help. You don't have the opportunity to kind of let those things slide. So I think everyone said all the things. I mean, the diet, making sure that they're not stressing themselves out and getting ulcers and then repetition. So like, Jimmy, I'm with you. I just totally wanted to stab myself with a fork in the eye and I did all the dressage tests and same thing, like keeping the level really low. And I find that... Um, especially the high level horses, like the minute you get to canter into the ring, they then can shorten themselves up more and start to get a bit um, much anticipating whether they're going to canter halt or go off into canter after the halt. And I don't know about anyone else, but at the last halt when they canter up the centre line, I've had them and the minute they go past X and you want to halt at G, they're like, no, no, I'm halting back there. And you're actually kicking them to keep them going. Um, so, yeah, I just think lots of repetition, taking the stress out of it, lots of schooling, definitely 100% having the arena in a 20 by 60 because we don't practice even smaller. So I'll shut myself into a 20 by 40 or 30 and then the 20 by 60 seems massive. So I don't know. If someone does come up with a solution or if KR could make um, a product that was called, you know, Dressage Winner, I think it would be a bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, I'll put it to the team and see what they can come up with, but I don't <laughs> like our chances. All right, so um, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us. Um, I know that it's the evening um, over in the states and different time zones. Emily, it's first thing in the morning for you, and for the for the other three of us, it's lunchtime. So. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you for everyone that did attend. Um, we'll certainly send you a link to this recording as well so you can watch it back. Um, and feel free to get in touch with us um, at any point um, if we can sort of help you further. So thanks, guys. See you later. <laughs>